Okay. Howdy, y'all. Thank you for y'all's patience. Sorry about the uh, delay uh, in getting started. Um, the good news is you don't have to listen to me talk for quite as long, so it's not actually that bad. Um, so my title, uh, as you can see, is all hashtags. A lot of people talk to me about that, which I think is pretty cool. Actually, the title was all hashtags and emoji originally. It was supposed to be that, but that got stripped out somehow in the conference submission system. So therefore, my new title is all of this plus include emojis resist. All right, so that's the, new, that's the new title, just to make sure everyone knows about that. So I'm from Impact Story. My name is Jason Prem. Uh, Impact Story is what it says on the slide. And I promised some uh, class participation today. So uh, I want to get straight into that. We were going to pair up. I'm not sure that it's quite the right room for that, so I modified it a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to ask a couple questions. And I wanted to get some answers from people, maybe get a little involved or whatever. So the first question is, why science? So you can just think about it, like why, why like when I say science, I'm thinking like writ large. I'm thinking the scientific approach to knowledge, right? So I'm including humanities, my own trainings in history, whatever, whatever type of knowledge pursuit we're thinking of that's systematic and we think of kind of the research infrastructure. Why are we doing science? Any thoughts? <laughs> yes, sir. Great. So to summarize that for, for anybody who wasn't hearing, uh, uh, the Richard Feynman answer of because we can, right? It's the kind of the Edmund Hiller, maybe, <laughs> right? Like, like because it was there. All right. Great. Love it. It's almost, it's almost like an aesthetic, an artistic kind of reason. So anybody else? You, you, you can just tell me and I'll, I'll summarize it quick. That way we don't get away from the mic. Like, OK. Very similar. Same thing. One, 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 other, one other answer, because we were short on time. Yeah. We do science to make the world better. All right, great. So we got a couple different answers, and I would love to actually like spend a ton of time like diving into this because I think it's really interesting what people say. Um, but we start, so we're just gonna like move it along kind of quickly. I personally, I like that answer. To me, that's that's the way I think of it myself a little bit. I, I think they're used to have polio, and then they couldn't walk, and I just think that's the worst. And then now, they mostly don't get polio, and then they can walk, and I think that's amazing like I'm serious like I wake up in the morning I think that's amazing like people don't get smallpox now and like if you knew someone who you loved and you had to watch them die of smallpox like and all you're thinking is surely there could be a way to fix this could we do something to fix it and we did that blows my mind we actually fixed it like how did that work like we fixed big problems and maybe there's other big problems maybe we can fix those with science too that's in my mind a lot of why we kind of do science second question Think about it for a second before you answer. Science, is it dangerous? And you can read that any way you want, but is it dangerous? Okay, actually, we'll just read a yes or no, because I see people nodding. Hands up, is it dangerous? Hands up, it's not dangerous. All right, great, we got a couple. All right, uh, someone who said it is dangerous, why? Yes, go for it, yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. All right. A anybody want to say why you think science is dangerous? Yes, sir. Yeah, when it's done badly, it can hurt people. Absolutely. I think that's true. And I think we could think of probably a million different ways that science could hurt people. But I don't think we have to actually think very hard if we want to look at, let's say, mustard gas. People used to fight all the time and they'd beat each other on the head with sticks and they would get hurt some. But there wasn't mustard gas before science. There wasn't nuclear weapons before science. There wasn't uh, uh, climate change prompted by internal combustion engines before science. Science didn't accidentally produce these things. It did it on purpose. Just like we cured the smallpoxes, we also created the mustard gases. We did that with science. Is it dangerous? Yes, it's super dangerous. And a lot of the idea behind science, a lot of the reason why we continue to pursue it is because it's a gamble. It's a crazy gamble that by using this approach to knowledge, by creating things with our minds in this systematic way, we can fix humanity before we destroy humanity. 
And I got it. We had a great conversation with Cameron Island about this uh, a couple weeks ago. It's super interesting. It's almost a balance. It's like, are we racing towards destruction faster than we're racing towards uh, fixing the world's problems? It's tough to know, but we're taking this gamble. We're, we're, we're putting the money in it, right? Who can we trust? Given that science is so dangerous, given that there are risks, very large risks societally for doing science, who are we supposed to trust with science? I'll take one single answer. Who, who like... Anybody? Who should we trust? About this table, it's making the rest of you guys look terrible. These guys are like, they're like up in front, they're ready to roll. All right, you trust yourself. I trust the community overall to fix it. Trust the community overall to fix it. Okay, so we got two answers from this table. That's how far ahead they are. Um, and trust this table, exactly. Um, I think that's a great point. I mean, I, I think that's a, a lot of, the, I think that more or less covers the gamut of what we would tend to, tend, tend to say. I mean, a lot of us feel like, hey, we should probably trust the community of experts, the people who know what they're doing, who have put the time into this, and, you know, there's some kind of checks and balances built into that community. And, and I think that's kind of a lot of, of, of how, you know, we've, again, sort of put our, 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 um, our chips on, on the board to say, hey, this is what we think we, this is how we think we can see. We kind of trust the experts on this one. But of course, who decides what an expert is, or to put it in Steffi's words, who decides what is the community? Does the community include, peop include people who are sure that there's a flat earth? Does the community include people who are sure that vaccines uh, produce autism? W why are those people considered not in the community by some, but they are considered in the community by others? How do we decide what counts as the community? How do we decide what counts as experts? Let's think about that for just a sec. Okay, anybody got an answer for that? All right, not this table. You guys are just like, yeah. <laughs> anybody got an answer for how do we decide who, who counts as an expert? Yeah. Time. Time. Can you expand on that? It takes time to see what is true. Okay, one more. Yeah. We're, so the person is supposed to demonstrate their expertise. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, so we heard time and we heard expertise, and in both cases, there's a sense of there's some kind of external uh, objective validity, right? So over time, we can see what worked and what didn't, and even right away, if we look at the, uh, at the evidence, we can see um, what worked and what didn't. And so I think what's starting to emerge from this is, and obviously, I was kind of like, you know, I made this slide in advance, so like, it's not like I'm, but what I'm hoping would emerge from this, and I think is, is that we have this world where we've got a community of experts, we've got people who are conveying the expertise, and we've got regular people. And, you know, whether those communicators are necessary or depending on the field, how much they do or whatever, you know, I, I think that's up for debate. But we certainly have this community of experts, we certainly have these regular people, and, and the expertise or the, I, could, I guess I could probably say knowledge, tends to flow down, and the money tends to flow up. That's an easy thing to forget, right? It's because all of this scientific stuff, this investigation we do, all of this thinking we do, all these looking for evidence that we do or whatever, all of that is, is paid for, right? It's paid for by bricklayers. It's paid for, my dad was a, a letter carrier. You know, he paid for it. Um, it's paid, I used to be a public school teacher, right? It's paid for by teachers. Like, everyone's paying for this. They're moving the money up, and then we're supposed to get expertise down. But I think, again, uh, uh, Cameron had a great presentation on this um, where he talked about, you know, is, is this continue, is this still working? Is this system still working, right? The idea was that the money was gonna go up, the experts do their thing, they're gonna go down. Increasingly, we see maybe there are cracks appearing in this system. We're seeing people start to say, maybe I should be an expert too. I, I, I read some stuff, I'm, I'm a movie star. I'm a movie star, I've got a platform, I can communicate. And so maybe I should say, no, vaccines definitely cause autism, right? Well, what's to stop me from doing that? What's to stop someone from believing me? Why should we trust experts? We see this idea of expertise in many ways under siege, right, or under attack. Like, why should regular people trust experts? Because after all, they're paying. Why should they have to wait uh, a whole bunch of time to get some pronouncements from expert and maybe they don't like it? Maybe they pay somebody else. Why should they have to pay some expert who says them something they want? Especially when we consider that science is this huge gamble. So we see, in my mind, another balance, right? We see this balance on science of like, are we going to solve the world's problems before we destroy ourselves? And I think we see a different balance of how much do we, how much do we expect regular people to continue to put money into science, but they are not part of the system that decides who is an expert or who isn't. They're not in that community. They listen to the community and they're supposed to trust the community, but they're not part of that community. So I think we see another balance in there of how can we continue doing science? I mean, after all, we just keep minting more and more science, right? To solve a price, 
wrote many decades ago, the number of science, scientists rather, uh, doubles about every 18 years. And that's been going on for as long as we've been able to keep track of scientists. And as he pointed out, eventually, of course, that's going to have to slow down. At some point, the approach that we're taking is going to have to stop. And when it does stop, what are we going to be left with? What are we going to be left with? How, how, how is this system going to work? When we run out of money to continue constantly minting new experts, to double the number of experts every 18 years, what are we going to do? A lot of this probably is going to circle around the web. And so my last question is, can the influence of the web be stopped. And when I say, can it be stopped, again, I'm going to reference Cameron's excellent points. In the early days, a lot of us felt like the web was going to fix everything, right? We're writing manifestos. We're like, knowledge is going to be free. Everyone's going to, uh, everyone's going to know everything about everything. It's going to be wonderful. But of course, in the last 10 years, what have we seen? We've seen, well, the web also makes it really easy to disseminate totally bogus garbage, right? Is the web making, making things worse? A lot of people feel like it is. They're saying, oh, you know, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a, a tyranny of the masses. It's a, the mob is, is, is destroying this idea of expertise. So I'm not going to ask for an answer for that, but I want us to think about it. Like, can the web be stopped? Can the pernicious influence of the web that flattens out knowledge and lets everybody have an opinion about everything and tell everybody, can that be stopped? Can this communication layer, can that be good? Because a lot of people feel like that's not helping us right now. So having asked those questions, I want to get a little bit more into specifics. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Unpaywall, which is something we made, and I will want to talk a little bit about Get the Research. And I thought it would be helpful to lay out why we think this is important, why the project is important, uh, using these five questions. And the reason is because we are trying to take a gamble in the open access community, whether we know it or not, we're trying to take a gamble to say, actually, regular people can be trusted, and science overall is moving in the right direction. So we're saying, number one, right, science moves in the right, we, we do think we're going to save the world before we kill it. And number two, we also think the community of experts can be expanded, can be expanded, include regular people. We think expertise, that, that mantle, that big box here of expertise, where we used to have these very clear demarcations, these expert community and regular people, we think that increasingly regular people should be able to get into that expertise box. And we think we have a path forward, and we think the way forward is by letting people be part of that expert conversation, right? Because it's a community, um, it's a community exercise. Expertise is something that, that is, as, as I think Stephanie nailed it, is it's decided by the community. What if we could enlarge that community and let regular people be part of that community? That's, I think, a really powerful idea and a really dangerous one. In the same way that doing science is dangerous, we know that knowledge is super dangerous. Letting regular people access knowledge is super dangerous, right? I mean, the world's uh, uh, mythology and um, uh, religious literature is full of warnings about the danger of knowledge, right? We've got the, the tree uh, you know, the, in the garden or whatever, and you eat the apple and you get knowledge, and it's super, super dangerous, right? We've got Odin giving away his eye for wisdom. He doesn't get his eye back. Like, he's, he's got to be one-eyed for the rest of, like, he's the one-eyed God, right? Because that's how, that's how dangerous knowledge is. And trusting regular people with knowledge is super dangerous. And, I, and one of the things that we hear a lot in the open access movie is not only can people not use this, but it's going to be dangerous, make the world worse. And I think there's some, some points to that. I think there's some points to that because people, anybody, to go from non-expert to expert, there has to be some kind of guidance. And that's what we're trying to do with Get the Research. So we started by doing... Um, on paywall. We started by saying, let's bring all of the world's open access into one place. So that's what Unpaywall is. It's a big database of every open access article that's ever been written by anyone. It's all in one spot. It's 20 million articles. We're going to be expanding that uh, by, like, what, 200% or something in the next couple months because we'll be adding things that don't have DOIs. But it's a totally free database. We're bringing it all in one spot and making that free for anybody to access. So that's kind of the first step. But then we started thinking, and we thought, A big building full of books isn't a library, right? A big building full of chairs and chalkboards isn't a school. That's the place where the library happens. That's the place where the school happens. But you've got to have librarians in there. You've got to have teachers in there. You've got to have someone who's doing the community, who's creating, who's making the community in the same way that my body it's, it's performing Jason Prem right now. It's creating Jason Prem by what I do but it has to have some kind of a soul, some kind of a life in it. Similarly, if we just say, here's 20 million articles, ta-da, that's not knowledge. That's 20 million articles, right? There's nothing there. So that's what we said. We need to build this thing that's a gamble that says we can trust regular people with this knowledge, but we're not just going to throw a bunch of articles at people. If we want to trust regular people with knowledge, we also have to make it 
uh, we have to do it responsibly. We have to help regular people uh, access and understand that knowledge in a meaningful way. We have to build not just the content, but the context around that content. And that's the idea uh, behind Get the Research. That's what you write if you want to say get the research on a slide. I don't know why I had that slide. So <laughs> I want to talk about a couple features. Now that I'm talking very expansively and talk, talking about the story, whatever, I want to get much more into specifics about what will be in Get the Research. So the idea behind Get the Research is it's a search engine over the unpaywall database, uh, and it allows anybody to find and understand scholarly research. So first you find it then you understand it. And it has sort of two screens. You can think of it in terms of, of, of two parts. It's vaporware right now, so you can't go use it or anything like that. You can sign up for early access at gettheresearch.org, which is cool, but you can't actually use it. So I'm going to describe a little bit. Uh, the first screen that you get for Get the Research, any kind of search engine, right, is a search screen. You search, and then you're going to get a, a SERP, a search engine result page, right? What are the features on that SERP that we could do that would be in service of this narrative of saying, let's let regular people access this dangerous resource of knowledge and do it in a way that's meaningful and helpful. So long slide to follow. Well, first of all, we want to let them subscribe. So knowledge is always changing. So we want someone to be able to make a search over something that's interesting to them, something that's important to them, and be able to keep up with the literature when something changes, right? That's pretty straightforward. Knowledge is always changing. People want to be able to follow knowledge, right? It's not a static thing. We want to be able to look at knowledge as an entity. So if you search on Google, you get a lot of times, if I search you know, woodchucks on Google, I get a little box it's from Wikipedia. Here's what I know about woodchucks, right? A woodchuck is generally this many centimeters long, and its lifespan, and blah, blah, blah. We want to do the same thing on Get the Research. We want to say, you don't actually want papers. You want knowledge. And where we can try and figure out what kind of knowledge you're looking for, and we can give you kind of an overview of that on the side, we're going to do that. So that's one step. That's, an, again, another specific. As uh, Clay Shirky famous said, right, it's not information over overload, it's filter failure. So if I want to look up, let's say my mom has a health condition called mitral valve pro prolapse. If she wants to look up mitral valve prolapse, she's going to get tens of thousands of articles about that. That's too many articles for her to read or for me to read or for anybody to read. So there needs to be some kind of a filtering on that to make it... Um, you know, to give you a place to start, right? To, to give you a place to start. And so filtering and ranking is a big part of that. So of course, we want to be able to filter by open access. That's one of the, the biggest kind of concepts behind what we're doing is people want to be able to read the literature, uh, not read that the literature exists. So we'll let people filter by open access, not probably the default view, right, is you just kind of look at stuff, number one, that you can read. We're also going to be ranking by alt metrics and citation. And again, you know, we're kind of still working on the exact details behind that, but we want to be able to show people that's meaning, show people content that's meaningful to the field, but also content that has been influential to other regular folks that people are talking about online. We think that's a really useful application for all metrics. If a lot of people have written news articles about it lately or whatever, there's a good chance that when I do a search, that's the type of content that I might want to see kind of towards the top of, of the results. Uh, and then we also want to do a lot of the disambiguating around synonyms. So um, if a person searches for cancer, uh, they definitely want to get papers about neoplasm. But they might not know that. They might not have that vocabulary. They might have that context. So we're going to be um, kind of doing all of that in the background to make sure that they're going to be getting the type of things that they're looking for. Uh, and then finally, so then uh, in the results, right, when we actually look at what papers did I get, we want to be giving people help, uh, giving them clues to make the most possible use out of that result set. Again, this is super powerful, right? They got all these papers. How can we make sure that someone who maybe doesn't have uh, a PhD in this topic is still going to get a lot of the um, a lot of the value that someone who does have a PhD would get, right? How, how can we build scaffolding, right? We want to build we want to build a scaffold that helps a person uh, not go from you know zero to a hundred like that because they can't do that, but go from you know zero to twenty. Um, so some examples of that is we, we can figure out what type of article they're looking at, right? So we can say, are you looking at an RCT? Are you looking at a systematic review? Is, is what you're looking at peer-reviewed or not? Those are things that we can automatically discern. We can put little badges next to that or uh, you know, little phrases or something like that. Um, we can definitely assess the reading difficulty of what they're looking at, and we can do that a couple different ways. There's just kind of the obvious al algorithmic ways, like Fle Fleisch Kincaid or something like that. But then we can also look at what uh, the behavior of other similar users, right, to see what kind of things they're clicking on, how long they took to read it, things like that. So we can look at the reading difficulty, and then uh, you know we can also help people out with the fact that you know this, again the scientific record is always changing. There's a small but significant percentage of retracted papers. 
we don't think there's any particular reason why we would want to display that at all. Right? The whole point of retracted paper is like, this shouldn't be in there anymore, right? So that's, I think, another area where we can maybe help people out who don't have a lifetime worth of training in this topic and can be easily sort of misled by a couple little, you know, blips on, on the record and say, let's filter that out. So either, either mark them or totally fluff, uh, filter them out altogether. And you know, we're still kind of at the brainstorming stage. I think we can probably think of a lot of other ideas. And we would love to hear other ideas from you guys. But this is the sort of thing that we're thinking about doing. And I'm going to move a little bit more quickly uh, through the article view. So we want to be able to link to other lit reviews. A lot of the contextualizing of a given article, if you click on the article and you're reading the article page on GTR, you don't uh, necessarily know that there's a whole body of literature uh, that helps put this article in context. So we can link up to lit reviews. We can start connecting and saying, hey, you might want to read the rest of the, the literature around this article because it's kind of a minority view, for instance, right? And you could find that out. Um, we want to link to other external content. So if people have written blog posts about it, people have written Wikipedia articles about it, you know, we're going to look into trying to link those together. Um, we call them Hamlet am annotations. When, when you read Hamlet uh, in school, those of us who have, I'm, I'm just curious, how many people read Shakespeare in school? OK, then this analogy will not fall on deaf ears. When you try and read Shakespeare, it's hard. It's all full of like weird words that I've never seen before. And it's like super confusing. But I'm supposed to read it because it's great literature or whatever. How do I make that work? Well, the, the way it mostly works is you explain the hard words for people as they're reading. Again, people are smart. People are, if they're motivated, they can learn so much. This is the gamble. This is the idea of gambling on people, gambling on regular people if you help them out. So when you read Hamlet, you've got annotations on the side. And when there's a hard word somewhere in there, generally it says. When there's an Elizabethan word or concept or phrase that I don't know because I live in the 20th or 21st century, I get an annotation. That's how people generally consume, consume Shakespeare today, right? Why isn't the scholarly literature that way? Right? If I'm reading the scholarly literature and I don't have the particular training, I'm, I'm faced with the exact same scenario of I'm reading this Elizabethan language, I'm, I'm reading this expert uh, expert tongue that I don't necessarily know, but with a little bit of help, I could figure it out. So we've already got that system prototyped. It's working. It's really cool. It recognizes entities in the text. Then it calls Wikipedia, finds definitions of those entries, and puts them in the margin right there on the page as you're reading. And again, to me, no one could ever read Hamlet, and yet they can with that approach. So we think that's going to be very powerful. Really excited about that. And then finally, we want to try and start looking into generating, and this is much harder, but plain language summaries of the paper. So in the same way that if you do a Reddit question for like explain like I'm five, right? Someone will kind of walk you through something that maybe you don't personally know. Or uh, similarly, uh, simple.wikipedia.org, which is really cool. It's a Wikipedia uh, that is like, a, you know, it's like an English language Wikipedia, but it's all the same articles, but they're written in much simpler language that would be easier to get if you're maybe not English is your first language, you're maybe very young, and it's just a little bit harder for you. So we want to be able to do the same kind of thing. We want to be able to translate, essentially, this article from expert ease into language that a regular person can understand. That's super challenging, super challenging. And uh, I think it's one of the big unqu uh, unanswered questions about whether we'll be able to do that at all. We'll probably start with maybe just kind of extracting a couple bullet points, and we'll see how, how well we do. So finally, what other features do we have? I'm just going to run through these real quick. Obviously, we'll have completely open API. It will be completely open source. What's cool about the API is we always build on our own APIs. So it means anybody who doesn't like our interface or doesn't like the kind of stuff we're doing, they can just use our same API and build a competing search uh, engine and, and do it better, which is great. We love that idea, right? The whole, whole point here is, are we willing to gamble that regular people can be trusted with this knowledge, that regular people can be invited in to this space that's just for experts, and they can play there too. We're also going to have um, educational resources, right? things that can help people understand the kind of uh, ways to, to skim or read a scientific paper. Teaching resources, again, I was a teacher, so I, I would love to have lesson plans up there. Um, so we're going to have that. And uh, it's not any good if no one knows about it. right? So we're going to be working uh, with the British Library, with a number of other partners, to help publicize this and, and help get it out there. We're going to go with a model that has, oops, it's gone. Where is it? Well, it's gone. I'm just going to tell you. It has layers. And the idea behind this layers is we want to kind of manage our risk. So um, the, this whole machine translation thing, that's super risky. So that's kind of layer three. If that works, great. We're going to be happy. But it's a little bit of a stretch. Layer two is improving. So layer three is kind of translating or transforming. Layer two, which is uh, lower risk. Um, is 
improving. So that has the annotations, it has the automatic recognition of what type of article it is, it's automatic linking between different types of articles. That's uh, much lower risk, we know how to do that, and so we feel pretty good about being able to complete that. And then layer one is the one that we absolutely know we can do, and that's just building a search engine on the literature at all. So the idea is, layer one's gonna happen for sure, Layer two will probably happen, we feel really good about it, and layer three might happen, we're gonna do our best. And so the idea here is, if we're wrong about some of the things that we think we can do, at least the world doesn't get nothing at all out of the, out of the exercise. So some of the challenges are, uh, we don't wanna dumb things down. The whole point of this is, like I said, it's a gamble to say regular people can read the actual expert literature. Not just a summary, not just what some, somebody who's a science communicator tells them, not just what their doctor tells them, but they can read the actual scientific literature that the real experts do. Yes, that is super dangerous. Yes, we are plucking the fruit from the tree of knowledge and giving it to people. But we're taking that gamble because fundamentally we think the open access movement is about trusting people. It's about saying we, as a species, we can all do this. We can all approach knowledge this way. So we don't want to dumb it down. So that's partly why we're doing this levels thing, because we're saying, hey, you know, level one and level two, there's, there's no translating at all in that. Right? You're, you're reading the actual words that the actual scientists wrote and that they're going to read as well. We're just going to provide some scaffolding. We're going to provide some help to make that easier. Um, getting the word out, I think it's going to be a challenge for sure. You know, we really want widespread usership of this. Of course, a ton of people want widespread usership of their thing. Right? So definitely those partnerships are going to be really important for us. Um, we don't know users are gonna like this, right? I mean, not that many people have built search engines on the scientific literature for regular people. Kind of the point of the scientific literature is it's not for regular people, it's for scientists. When scientists write it, they're not thinking about how regular people are gonna read it. So it's a bit of a gamble, right? Regular people could look at this and say, this is stupid, I don't like it, I'd rather read WebMD, I'd rather just not know, I don't care. So that's a risk, we're gonna find out. I, we definitely know that there are groups that are gonna be early adopters, right? So patient advocates are bigger adopters for this. Um, I don't know, like both my and Heather's parents like have health conditions and they want this thing, right? So it's not hard to find a few people who want it and then we'll try and kind of expand from there. Um, we'll certainly ship early and often. We have a prototype coming in December. Um, the faster you get something out there in our experience, the faster you can find out whether people actually like it. And if they don't, you can kind of pivot or, or change direction a little bit. And then finally, it is a pretty ambitious timeline. It's a two-year grant. Um, it's from the Arcadia Foundation, which I should have said like multiple times already. Uh, okay, Arcadia Fund, anyway. Um, but yeah, it's a two-year grant. And uh, yeah, it's pretty ambitious to get anything done. Uh, we'll see. That's kind of where we live. We generally try and take on pretty big projects and get them done fast. Um, we are hiring some people, which is the first for us to try and uh, move things along a little bit quicker. Um, now we're done. Thank you guys for your patience. Thanks for our funders very much.